It's a pleasure to be at St. John's, even uh, when I have to struggle with hearing aids and a mask and other things. Um, it's a great joy to be back here on the Sunday that you're beginning to uh, regather. And uh, I have every assurance, both for the diocese and in the state, that we are going to find that we can open the gates even larger to receive people more and more. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Because the date for filing income taxes was late this year, last Friday, I was thinking of my father because he was undoubtedly the most honest person I ever knew. Now he was a mechanical engineer and he was very good at math, but he would spend hours and hours and hours over the tax return agonizing about making sure that he was paying the government everything that he owed. Later on in life, I realized that there were many other people who spend the same amount of time desperately looking for a loophole or hoping that they, uh, their original calculations were wrong. But that wasn't my father's situation. I have never really known anyone quite like that. But I think that it had a lot to do with the fact that he was a first generation American. His parents were born in Germany and emigrated as children with their parents to this country. And I have no doubt that my father felt deeply indebted to this country where he had been able to do good things, where he had prospered, and where he felt he wanted to be as generous as he could be in giving back for what had been given to him. I grew up in a family in which Honesty was the bottom line, and perhaps you did too. I don't think this, this was so unusual. When I got into trouble or my brother would get into trouble, both of us learned very early on that if we tried to lie about it, we would be in much more serious trouble and the punishment would be far worse. So it encouraged us to tell the truth. And I grew up really believing that truth was really important. Now my wife and I have been married for 54 years, some of you know Nancy, and often people ask folks who have been married as long as we have, what's the secret? Because of course everyone who's married knows that it isn't always easy. There are strifes and times that are difficult in any marriage. And I usually say it in one word, trust. Trust is based on honesty and that which enables our relationships and so much else to endure is the trust that we have. Now today's gospel from John is part of a much longer reading. It sometimes is seen as a sermon. We've been hearing it for several weeks now. Sometimes it's more of a prayer it's supposedly what Jesus said to his disciples on the night before he died, but of course it's so long and so involved that it's very unlikely that Jesus said it then, although it's undoubtedly based on things Jesus probably said at various times and others, other places. But it serves the gospel writer well to use it as a whole. And in today's rather confluted story, um, we hear that God and Jesus are one, and therefore we are one with God through Jesus. Now that shouldn't come as any great news to Christians, but it's the reality of the oneness that we share. Our oneness is not that we agree with one another, as the average Episcopal parish can make clear. It's not so much that we um, have like-mindedness, it's that we have the same spirit and we can acknowledge one another as children of God despite our differences. And then today's passage goes on to talk about how we are in the world and Jesus is no longer except through us in the world. And he's not drawing us out of the world, he says, but he is hopefully empowering us with his spirit 
to transform the world. And truth is used several times in this gospel. In fact, it's the last word in the passage that we had. And in the prayer part of today's gospel, Jesus says, sanctify them, which means you and me, with the truth. Your word is truth. I think what he's suggesting is that his relationship with the Father and our relationship with him are what is most true in this world. It calls us to a life of empowerment because we have been loved by God, demonstrated in Jesus, and are called to go and love the world in Christ's name. It's also fair to say that in a different part of John's gospel, Pilate at the trial of Jesus says cynically, what is truth? Because even in the ancient world, there were people who told lies, there were different interpretations of what the truth should be. It's not quite the same thing today. I think the fact that we live in a world in which people hold alternative realities is a far more dangerous thing than what existed in Pilate's time when simply people disagreed. What has happened to truth today and honesty? I worry about our children and our grandchildren. If we don't take some time to talk with them about what they hear on the television and see, and see acted out about us, the fact that there are many people who do not hold truth in high esteem. Now, there have always been liars and people who cheated in governments, even in the church. But we are seeing a different kind of movement whereby whole groups of people seem to be advocating a different sense of truth and falsehood. Our faith, the Christian faith, calls us to be honest and truthful. Lying really doesn't have a place in the Christian home, in the Christian marriage, in Christian society, although it is very clear that our society is largely secular, which makes our work so much more important to bear witness to the ways in which we are called to be people of the truth. When lying becomes a way of life, as it is for some people, it greatly distorts things. I was only half listening to the television in December, and I think the politician was a Democrat, but I don't know, I don't remember. I wasn't really listening to him. But when he concluded, he said something that really caught my attention. He said, well, the end justifies the means. Isn't that the Christian gospel? And I found myself yelling at the television <laughs> as I, I don't know whether you do or whether I'm just strange about that. But I, I find the television often quite upsetting. And I, I'm yelling at the tops of my lungs, no, that is just the opposite of what the Christian ethic is. If you have corrupt means, you will naturally corrupt the end, even if the end seemed good to you at the time. You cannot reach good ends. You cannot reach love and care and relationships on the basis of the fact that you are being dishonest or because you are trying to manipulate things and cheat. Jesus makes this so clear. Corrupt means corrupt the end. Our means and our ends need to be such that they dovetail together to support the end, which for us, we are called to make that end good. Finally, in this same gospel, but in a different chapter, Jesus says one of his greatest I am statements, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But what does it mean? that Jesus is our truth. Among the things I think it means is that when people met Jesus, as we have perhaps met Jesus, especially in other people, 
We know that he rings true. There is something authentic about his personhood. He is what we see him to be. There is no plicity here. Jesus is the very essence of God's love poured out for us in an attempt to make us more loving and to be able to cooperate with God in bringing the world to a different place. Jesus is our truth in a very deep sense. Jesus is what human beings are designed to be. Loving, caring, healing, teaching. These are all things that are very definitely how we think of and remember Jesus. And they're also instructions for us as to how we can be agents for change and for good in our own society. I hope especially as we remake our baptismal covenant in today's service, that you will think seriously about how it is that you're being called to be an agent of honesty and truth and how that honesty and truth might triumph for the benefit of our society and the benefit of all of us. Amen.